everyone. Today we are starting Unit 5. We are going to be covering some more information about triangles in general. So Section 4 was all about triangles, triangle congruence, and we were proving their congruence. Now we are through the proofs and we're just looking at some more specifics about triangles, information about triangles, and what you can do to solve within missing pieces. So we're going to go ahead and start with a little bit of review of the types of triangles. And I'm my guess is a lot of you probably don't remember any of this stuff, so you'll want to make sure that you're taking your time to uh, pause, draw out the pictures, and write down the information. I already have most of it in here, so you're going to need to be pausing a few times probably. Um, and then after that, we'll look at solving for x in our triangles, so solving for those missing pieces. So we have two primary ways that we classify triangles. We classify them using their angles and using their sides. So we're going to start with angles here, and I have these four classifications. I have acute triangles, which are where all angles are less than 90 degrees. Obtuse triangles, where one angle is larger than 90 degrees. Right triangles, where one angle is 90 degrees. And equiangular triangles, where all angles are equal to 60 degrees. So those are all the classifications by angle. Now we're going to look at classifications by their sides. So I have the isosceles triangle, where two sides are congruent, scalene triangles, where there are no congruent sides, and equilateral triangles, where all sides are congruent. And equilateral triangles and equiangular triangles happen to be the same. So if you have an equilateral triangle, it's also equiangular. And if it's equiangular, it's also equilateral, which we can get into another time. All right, so let's take a look at an example where we're going to classify these triangles by their side lengths and angle measures. So I have classified triangle EHG by its side lengths. So let's zoom in over here. I have EHG and this triangle by side lengths. I'm noticing I have 12 and 11, and those two side lengths aren't the same. So we are either looking at scalene or isosceles. And then we have 10 and 4 down here. 10 plus 4 is equal to 14. That's not equal to 12 or 11. So that means that triangle EHG has to be a scalene triangle because the side lengths are not the same. Next, I have EHG by angle measures. So if I look at this, EHG doesn't have any angle markings, but that's all right because we can tell if an angle is acute or obtuse. And if it's right, it would be marked. Uh, this is acute. That's acute. This is also an acute angle. They're all less than 90 degrees and greater than zero. If all angles are acute, then that means that this is an acute triangle. Next, we have classified EHF. And that was by side lengths. So I have EHF. I have 10. 10 is congruent over here by these tick marks, so 10, 10, 12. Since I have two congruent sides, then that means that I have an isosceles triangle, which is spelled I-S-O-S-C-E-L-E-S. -S -E -E and then if we want to look at that same triangle by its side lengths, or sorry, angle measures, we have triangle E-H-F. There's a right angle right here. And because there's a right angle in the triangle, then it automatically makes it a right angle triangle. So I have a right triangle, and you might be noticing that we had the same triangle and then the same triangle. So every triangle is classified by both angles and sides. So it's not just one category it falls into, it can fall into more than one category. Alright, let's go ahead and look at one more example here where we have um, some side lengths, but we are missing some information. So we want to find all of the side lengths of this triangle, but we only have expressions. Now, normally you can't solve if you just have an expression, but if you notice in the triangle, we have these tick marks, which means that this is an isosceles triangle because you have two sides that are congruent. And since our sides are congruent, I can set these equal to each other and solve for our missing piece, which is x. So I have over here jk is equal to KL, which means that 4x minus 
is equal to 2x plus 6.3. I'm going to move some of these pieces at the same time. So if I'm wanting to stay positive, which I prefer, then I'm going to subtract 2x from this side and bring it over here. So I'm going to add 10.7 to both sides. So I'm going to do that all in one step, subtracting 2x and adding 10.7. So 4x plus, or minus 2x is 2x. 10.7 plus 6.3 is 17. Divide out the 2 from both sides. That means x is equal to 8.5. That's kind of like a checkpoint. Now that we have x, we can use that to solve for our missing pieces. So I already know that kl is 2x plus 6.3, and jk is 4x minus 10.7, but they have the same value. So if I pick one of them to solve with, then I can find both side lengths in one go. So I'm going to start with that I have KL is equal to 2X plus 6.3. So KL is equal to 2 times 8.5 plus 6.3. And that's also equal to JK. So I'm going to go ahead and solve that. 8.5 times 2 is equal to 17. And we're going to add that to 6.3, which means that KL and JK are both going to be equal to uh, 7 plus 6 is equal to 13. So I have 23.3 for both of those side lengths. All right, so now that we have found those two side lengths and X, we can use that information to solve for our third side which is JL and is equal to 5x plus 2. So JL is equal to 5 times 8.5 plus 2. 5 times 5 is 25, carry the 2. 5 times 8 is 40, plus 2 is 42. So I have 42.5 plus 2, which means JL is equal to 44.5. And those are all three of my side lengths, 23.3, 23 23.3, and 44.5. And I will also mention that while JK and KL have the same measurement, you can't just write JK equals KL equals 23.3. You need to identify all three pieces. So I'm looking for three separate answers. All right. So next we have this proof, and I'm not going to make you guys solve it, but it is important that you see it. So first it says, prove that the sum of all angles of a triangle must equal 180 degrees. So that information is actually enough information for me to draw this picture here. So I have triangle ABC, and I have angles 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And this triangle, the vertex of the point C, is on line L, which is parallel to side AB of our triangle. And all of that information is helpful with proving that all the sum of all angles must equal 180 degrees. So line L is parallel to AB because it's given. And angle 1 is congruent to angle 4, and angle 2 is congruent to angle 5, both by the alternate interior angles theorem, because we have a parallel line cut by a transversal such that we have alternate interior angles, and again, cut by a transversal such that we have alternate interior angles. Next, we have that the measure of angle 4 plus the measure of angle 3 plus the measure of angle 5 is equal to 180 degrees because those three angles form a straight line, which means they must be 180 degrees by the angle addition postulate. Then, since we already know that 1 is congruent to 4, and 2 is congruent to 5, we can replace those things in our proof. So we end up with the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 3 plus the measure of angle 2 is equal to 180 degrees by the substitution property, which is what we were trying to show. Because 1, 2, and 3 are the measures inside of our triangle. So this is for some arbitrary triangle, and it's actually going to be true for all triangles in Euclidean geometry. So we can use this proof to say all triangles have exactly 180 degrees inside the triangle. And that is the triangle sum theorem. So what we just proved is this theorem that says 
that the sum of all angle measures of a triangle is 180 degrees. All right, so now that we've proven that the sum of all angles in a triangle is 180 degrees, there's a couple of corollaries that we can draw conclusions from that theorem. So I have the acute angles of a right triangle are complementary. So angles D and E must add up to 90 degrees because the third angle is already 90 degrees. And the measure of each angle of an equal equiangular triangle is 60 degrees. So all angles must be 60 degrees because they're all congruent and there must be 180 degrees inside of all those angles. The triangle, I mean. Okay, let's take a look at another example here. So I have example three that says to find the measure of each angle in the figure to the right. So I have this triangle here, and I'm noticing that x is in both, so I have two congruent angles, and 3x plus 20 degrees. So we're going to go ahead and solve by recognizing that we have this triangle sum theorem that says that x plus x plus 3x plus 20, so the sum of all angles, must be 180 degrees. So I really have 1, 2, 2x plus 3x is 5x. So I have 5x plus 20 is equal to 180. I can subtract 20 out from both sides. That gives me 5x is equal to 160 degrees. I'm going to divide out 5 on both sides which means x is equal to 32, which is two of our angles. So x is equal to 32 degrees, that's two of our angles. Now we still need to solve for the third angle. We have a couple different options here. Um, we can recognize that two of our angles must be 32. 32 plus 32 is 64, subtract 64 from 180. Or we can plug that in to our expression and solve, which is what I'm going to do. So I have three x, which is now 32, plus 20 is equal to, 3 times 32 is equal to 96, plus 20, which means that our angle is equal to 116 degrees. So we have 32 degrees, 32 degrees, and 116 degrees for the angles in this triangle. All right. So sometimes we're given an image, and sometimes it doesn't tell us the angle measures or give it to us in an image. Sometimes we're given a ratio. So example four says the measures of the angles of a triangle are in a ratio of one to three to four. Find the measure of the largest angle. So if we have a ratio of one to three to four, then that means that we have one parts of something in one angle, three parts of something in another angle, and four parts of something in a third angle. But we don't know how many of those parts there are. So those are technically three expressions. So I have 1x, 3x, and 4x. And if we add those together, then those all together should be 180 degrees. We don't know what size they are, we just know that there's four grouped, three grouped, and one group. So if I add these together, that gives me 8x which is equal to 180 degrees. I'm going to divide 8 out on both sides, which means x must be equal to 22.5 degrees. Okay, that would be our smallest angle, but it doesn't ask for the measure of the smallest angle. It asks for the measure of the largest angle. And I will mention sometimes your smallest angle is not 1x, so be careful of that. That's just x, that's not our angle measure. So our largest angle is 4x, so I can plug that in. So I have 4 times 22.5, which is equal to, uh, 4 times 5 is 20, carry the 2, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10, carry the 1, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9, so this is equal to 90 degrees. So our largest angle is 90 degrees, and that's what we were trying to solve for in the first place. So this is kind of like a checkpoint answer, whereas 90 degrees is your actual answer. And you have to do the solving to get to that. All right, so not only can we find using interior angles, we also have something called an exterior angle. 
and that's shown here. So an interior angle is formed by two sides of a triangle. It's the angles that are inside of a triangle. Exterior angles are formed by one side of the triangle and an extension of the adjacent side. So if you took one side of the triangle and you continued on, it creates this angle here, angle 4, which is called an exterior angle. So an exterior angle is an angle that is outside of the triangle, but is formed by a side of the triangle. So 1 and 2 are remote interior angles of angle 4. And that information is going to come in handy in just a moment. So 1, 2, and 3 are interior. Angle 4 is exterior. And angle 1 and angle 2 are not touching. They're not supplementary with angle 4. So we call those the remote interior angles of angle 4. So that's more vocab. And we haven't really talked about those before. But we are going to do a proof about these things. And then we'll talk a little bit more about why we need that information. So... Proof number two says to prove that the sum of two interior angles is equal to the opposite exterior angle. So if we look at this picture here, what we're trying to show is that the sum of angle one and angle two is equal to the measure of angle four. So let's take a look at this proof here, which is already filled in. Again, you're not going to solve this proof on your own. You just do need to know where this theorem is coming from, and this proof tells you why. So we have this figure shown above, it's given to us, and we know that the measures of angle one, angles 1, 2, and 3, and the sum of them is 180 degrees by the triangle sum theorem. Next, we know that the measure of angle 3 and the measure of angle 4 also add up to 180 degrees because they form a linear pair, so that's by the definition of a linear pair. Because both of these equations have the same value of 180 degrees, then we can say that these two equations are, are equal to each other. So angle 1 plus angle 2 plus angle 3 is equal to angle 3 plus angle 4 by the transitive property. Because angle 3 is on both sides, we can subtract that out, and that leaves me with angle 1 plus angle 2 is equal to angle 4 by the subtraction property. So what we just proved is actually called the exterior angle theorem. And the exterior angle theorem says the measure of an exterior angle of a triangle is equal to the sum of the measures of its remote interior angles. So the two angles in a triangle that are not connected to this exterior angle, you add them together, they're equal to it. And we'll take a look at that in an example. And when we get to that example, it will help make a little more sense. Um, we also have this third angle theorem, which we've already talked about, so we're not going to go in depth here, uh, but it's here if you need the refresher. All right, so now we're going to take a look at some examples. This first one is going to use that exterior angle theorem. So it says to find the value of x in the figure below, and we have x, 49, and 113. Now, what's happening here is we have this angle that extends, or the side that extends, and creates an angle right here that is 113 degrees. Because this is the exterior angle of these two, those are the remote interior angles, then the sum of these things should equal this angle. So 113 degrees is equal to 49 plus x. If I subtract 49 out from both sides, then x is equal to 64 degrees. All right, example six says find the value of x in the figure below. So x is down here, and I need to find both this angle and possibly this angle to solve for this. But in order to find this angle, which I am for sure going to need, I have to find this one because these form vertical angles. And what I'm noticing I'm going to call this angle B. We have that exterior angle theorem right here. B plus 39 must be equal to 97. So we can say 97 minus 30, or well, we'll just write the whole thing out, is equal to 39 plus B. I'm going to subtract 39 to both sides, which means B is equal to 58 degrees. Since B is 58 degrees, 
then this other angle must also be 58 degrees because these are vertical angles. Next, I have x and 58, and those are remote interior angles of this angle that has 102 degrees. So if I were to write that out, then I can say the 102 degree angle is equal to 58 degrees plus x. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 58 from both sides, which means x must be equal to 44 degrees. And that is the answer that I was looking for. I will also mention, if you didn't remember the remote interior angles um, in the exterior angle theorem, you could also use this linear pair. Add these two up, subtract it from 180, and that gives you B. B is congruent. 180 minus 102 would give you this angle. These two angles added together, subtracting from 180, would give you X. So there's another way to get there, but it's much longer, and we don't really want to do that if we can help it. Let's take a look at example seven here, which says to find the three missing angles in the diagram below. So I have X, Y, and Z that I'm solving for. I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see this picture a little better. Um, and I'm noticing right away that I have X and 26 that are remote interior angles of Z. So that will be helpful if we can find X. And I'm also noticing that X, 73 and 75 form one triangle. So I'm gonna start with that. So I have 73 and 75 that if we say X is equal to 180 minus 73 minus 75, which means that X is equal to 32 degrees. Since X is 32 degrees, and I'm just gonna go ahead and write that up here too, and 26 degrees, and those form a exterior angle theorem with Z, then we can use that to solve for Z. So Z is equal to 32 plus 26, which means Z is equal to, um, let's see, 58 degrees. So there's two of our answers. And now we need to find angle Y. And since angle Y and angle Z form a straight line, then we can subtract angle Z from 180 to get angle Y. So I have 100, or Y is equal to 180 minus 58. So Y is equal to 122 degrees. And those are my three missing angles. All right, this is where we're gonna go ahead and stop for today. We'll pick it back up in section two, where we'll cover mid-segment triangles and a little bit about uh, some triangle inequalities.